five years on from an historic high in the polls at general election 2020, Sinn Féin is hoping to do again what they did in 2020, turn around from a disappointing local election result. Entering this election has been marked by a number of internal controversies in the party, but in government they promise to improve housing, encouraging more workers into the health system, the education system and abolishing the TV licence fee and a lot more in the manifesto. But to look at their proposals, we're joined now by the Sinn Féin leader, Mary Lou MacDonald. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Pat. Thank you so much. Now, um, on housing, we were talking with all the various party leaders and you all have the same kind of ambition to reach 60,000 per year by 2030. So it's hard really to distinguish very much between the ambitions, whatever about the mechanisms. Well, the the scale of ambition has been confirmed by the government's own housing commission established by the outgoing government and then duly ignored by the outgoing uh, government of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Um, but there is a very, very key distinction between us and them and that is that they have manifestly failed over the last five years and more to get to grips with, to appreciate even the scale of the housing crisis. We, by contrast, uh, know that this is a must-do, must-solve crisis for the next government that we hope to uh, lead. And we are putting our money where our mouths are. And we have published, unlike them, a very comprehensive five-year plan um, Owen O'Brien, my colleague, uh, has worked very hard on this with, with the rest of the team. We have collaborated and consulted with the sector, every part of it, to ensure that if for the first time uh, we have the opportunity of a, a government led by Sinn Féin, that we are ready to deliver on okay. day now, one. The, the criticisms that have come from other parties, uh, starting again from go back to the drawing board with the Land Development Agency, they say that actually puts a stop to what's going on at the moment. Having to go back to the drawing board will only lead to delays. And the second criticism, as you know, is the withdrawal of help to buy schemes, which you don't feel money is well spent uh, by the current government doing. Okay, so let me deal with those in in turn. You see, the Land Development Agency, when it was first conceived, uh, was to create a pipeline of uh, land for development. It was never initially conceived, Pat, that it would become the developer, the delivery mechanism for homes. Uh, And we think a huge mistake has been made in shifting it from its original uh, mandate and then leaving it with no compulsory purchase uh, uh, powers either. So what we want to do is actually repurpose this agency, make it fit for purpose, because to deliver the scale of, of, of housing that is required, it does mean that you have to have that pipeline of available uh, land and that ought to be their task. They should not be the builders of home. And if you look to the government's, the government's own figures, it, it's clear that their approach with the Land Development Agency has failed. So far from us causing a complication, we're setting out to correct mm. for a mistake of the outgoing now, government. Now, the other mistake you um, maintain is all this help to buy stuff that the yeah, government, a and, number of schemes which they put in place. Yeah, so just remember that housing, uh, home ownership for the under 40s in particular has literally collapsed on the watch of Fine Gael and uh, Fianna Fáil. Uh, the the price uh, for a first time buyer of a new home in the Dublin area over the last five years has gone up by a hundred and twenty five thousand euros. The statewide figure, Pat, is ninety thousand euros. So the scale of failure uh, is absolutely breathtaking. Sinn Féin, by contrast, is the party of home ownership and uh, of first time buyers. So what we want to do is scale up the delivery uh, of homes. Uh, We've set out in considerable detail how we will do that. We want prices to be affordable. We are proposing to do away with stamp duty for first time buyers up to a value of uh, €450,000 on on those purchases. But it's currently only 1%, so it it is a relatively trivial amount in terms of the total borrowing. Pat, when you're putting your your sums together to buy your first home, there are no trivial sums, which brings me to the issue of the, the help to buy. Though. Oh yeah, I, know, I remember. Draconian. I remember. Um, uh, on the help to buy scheme, what we are saying is that as we ramp up uh, supply, as we deal properly with the affordability issue, we are going to phase that scheme out. And I think it is 
astonishing. But let me be clear, for those who have now baked in those numbers and that scheme for a purchase this year, or next year or the year after, you are not going to face a, a, th- that money disappearing before your yeah. eyes. But let me make this point. The fact that government are so out of ideas, that they have failed so comprehensively, that the only idea they have is to extend a scheme that at the in the in at best should have been temporary, I think tells you that they are conceding mm. that they can't deal with this issue and they can't actually now, make now, housing one, affordable. One of the challenges, no matter who comes into power, is finding the workforce to ramp up the numbers now, no matter who they are, be it your, your own party or uh, the current government parties, trying to find 47,000 extra building workers in short order. I mean, who's, where are they going to come from? I mean, you, you talk about apprenticeships. They take time and there aren't 47,000 apprenticeships in the system. Yeah, well, but on apprenticeships, I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say that we, we have to scale that up. And we also have to make it more efficient. You talk to young apprentices and very often, Pat, their frustration is that there is delay upon delay upon delay and it's taking so much more time just to finish their time. So we, we do need to get much more and how serious would you do, and efficient. Just how would you do that? Because you're depending on the private sector to take these apprentices on board for their their block release. When yeah, they well, I, I, I think that experience. can be. I think that can be done in a much more proactive and orderly way. I, I know talking to many young apprentices, I think a, an inordinate level of responsibility is left on the individual to find their placement and to 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 pursue that. So I think we can organise that better. But I also know that in terms of allowances paid to to those that train and those that are uh, in the classroom that we have work to do there. So that's one strand of it. Remember this also, the construction uh, workforce is at the same level. Actually, it's a little bit higher than it was in the times of the so-called Celtic Tiger. So it is still a very substantial workforce. We need to direct all of its efforts to the things that we need built. I don't think we need more apart hotels. I know that we need uh, more homes. So we we need need more hospitals. Do we need more motorways built? We do. Do we need more... Infrastructure we, build water. We absolutely do. We so absolutely where are they do. Come and from? there is you a lot to be them. done. No, and I, I would be the first to say that we have to grow the workforce. Absolutely. Uh, one of the proposals that I have, uh, that we have, is if uh, if we lead the next government and if I occupy the office of Antishuk, one of the specialist uh, committees that, that I would head up uh, and chair is uh, on workforce planning for construction as you've we've discussed here, but also for our, for our health services. Those for me uh, are two really immediate priorities. But, but we, in- we have we have capacity, so we shouldn't lo- miss that. But you're right, we have to But, but you're have saying this, in, in all your policies, more Gardaí, more healthcare yeah. workers, more childcare workers, uh, more teachers, or pre- giving teachers bonuses for having worked in the Gulf and coming back and so on. Um, it, it's a problem that every government will face, not just your government when it comes in. So what's different about what you can do to overcome the problems that others might find Well, one of the huge differences uh, between uh, a Sinn Féin-led government and Fianna Fáil uh, or Fine Gael is that we are consciously setting out and saying very directly to our young people that we want you to stay. We want you to have your opportunity here to build your family, build your life and contribute to our health service, our construction uh, sector. And we are going to move heaven and earth to make that a possibility. We're also saying to those that have gone, um, whether they're in Australia or Canada or anywhere else, and who now look back home and say, you know what, I can't come home because the opportunity isn't there for me, that we want to turn that around. I have lost count, Pat, out on the campaign trail of young teachers, student nurses who are telling me directly how betrayed they feel, how demoralised they feel, because it, far from being encouraged okay, so to stay, the, they the believe that what there is, is the a plan push. To okay. keep them here. Because, I mean, a lot of them will just look at the money that's available in, in the Gulf states and say, I'm going, not because I can't or don't want to stay here, but because I can make big bucks tax-free over there and come back with a wadge in my pocket. But even in those circumstances, and I, I disagree that a majority of newly trained and qualified teachers would, would have that motivation, but even if they did, you still have to make a pathway for them to come back right as and when they're ready. Teachers will tell you uh, that they they qualify, uh, they're chasing hours, they're chasing permanency, 
we have a problem staffing our classrooms and yet we don't have a system that says and grabs young teachers and says, here's your full contract. Here's the proper terms uh, and conditions for you. And worse than that, we have some in the political class uh, 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 who think it's appropriate to mock and to jeer young teachers, which I find absolutely you're, reprehensible. You're referring to the Michael O'Leary speech. I am, yeah. But when you listen to his uh, whole speech, he says he wants them in the classroom. He just doesn't want them in Doyle Air. Well, I, I think he may have meant that it was heard uh, no, no, in another the, way. The full, co- the full quote does say that. It's not and what he meant, it's what he said. Uh, I, I, and it, Michael O'Leary is entitled to whatever view he has. I'm not really talking about him. I'm talking about the political uh, response from political people rather than him. In the case of the health service, uh, we believe that we have to give to our health graduates a job guarantee. So if you are a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist or a speech and language therapist or a nurse, you should not be left on panels waiting months and months for a contract within the public uh, health system. You know what happens to a lot of those young uh, people, they get so demoralised that they say, right, well, this isn't going to happen. And they either go into the private sector or more and more of them are actually going away. Mm. Our student nurses okay, and the uh, other, so, so the other students need bursaries ha- to help I'm, them through we their training We know what the problem well. is. We know what the problem is. The question is, what are you going to change? I mean, the HSE has a recruitment embargo from time to time, for right. example. They have a budget which is set by government and they operate, they try to within that budget. They use agency staff where they think it's appropriate. What are you actually going to change? Are you going to kind of take the the HSE and root and branch change at all? Well, I, I think I've set out for you in terms of students uh, and in terms of new graduates and the idea of a job guarantee. We, we need to make that happen so that we have the uh, so that we have the. How does capacity. that actually work in practice? I mean, you've got hospitals all around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, who who is going to be forced to give to make job offers? that impact on their budget, for example. I mean, they are all crying, crying Pat, out for is, more consultants. They can't get them. Pat, there isn't a, a hospital. There, there, there is, it, it's not a case. You are not going to be forcing an unwilling system to recruit. People who have to manage and run the health services will tell you at first hand just how tight things are, just how short staff there. The government denies, by the way, that they have a staffing uh, embargo. Um, but the reality is that they do. And we have the crazy situation where on the one hand, full-time posts are being suppressed. And on the other hand, the cost of agency has literally ballooned. So not alone are those of us, you know, everyone who relies on the health services, are we being short-staffed and, and short-changed? But actually, we're not getting okay, value for money stating, either. You're still stating the problem. What's no, the solution? No, I'm not. I'm, I've told you the solution. We want, we want over a five-year uh, period, we recognise that there will have to be uh, recruitment into the health service at the rate of 42,000 new And how posts. are you going to do that? That's, That's the point. It's like everything you say. We need more guards. Yeah, how are we going to do it? We need more healthcare workers. How are you going to do it? We need more teachers. We need more SNAs. We need the devil and all. How are you going to do it? But, in, but in a country that by and large has full employment. But but I've just described to you, the, for, I've said to you, for example, uh, health graduates, nursing, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, will have a job guarantee. We're going to stop the practice of leaving them endlessly on panels waiting and waiting. We're going to ensure that they are appointed, that they're up and running and that they are working. We're going to work hard by working on wider societal issues to get to stop people going, to get people uh, to to come home. I also think that we can sharpen up the recruitment processes themselves, which are overly centralised within the HSE and we can trust for example, individual hospitals to recruit much more directly, much more efficiently. So I think you saw the benefit of that, for example, during the COVID uh, period. Moving on to other matters, um, you promised to abolish the licence fee with immediate effect, end geo-blocking in the north and uh, I think controversially commissioning an independent human rights and journalistic expert to review the objectivity of coverage by RT of the Gaza coverage and other international conflicts. That's a bit chilling. I don't think it's chilling at all. And can I tell you, I'm I'm a bit taken aback at some of the response uh, to this idea, which, by the way, is one line in a manifesto that runs to hundreds of pages, just to but, make that but point. But it only takes one line to be chilling. Yeah, well, it, it's not chilling in the least. I, I think that... Uh, I mean, the, what are you saying about Ortiz's coverage I, uh, well, that has dismayed you? Well, well, I am. what I am saying uh, is, is this, that an organisation, Ortiz's uh, standing 
was considerably damaged in the public mind because of all sorts of different governance issues and so on and so forth. But not the, once in those uh, Doyle the, committees was there any reference yeah, to bias coverage yeah, well, of news. And, and I'm, I, and let me finish out the point. The government saw fit correctly to institute independent oversight for governance reviews. RT is in receipt of, what, 725 million euros of taxpayers' money. They occupy, with all due respect to other broadcasters, a very specific space in Irish public life, in the Irish public and democratic uh, conversation. And we think that it is a good idea that either their editorial board or Kamashun Naman institute a practice of peer review, not by politicians, by journalists, by human uh, rights uh, experts to build and grow and reinforce confidence in that broadcaster. And by the way, the BBC, the BBC, hardly the most radical institution on earth, instituted a similar review. In their case, it was on uh, migration uh, policy. I am arriving at no conclusion. I am simply saying in a world where people have to trust Broadcasting more generally, why Gaza but particularly, particularly why Gaza particularly for this why not, reason, uh, you know Donald Trump. Why not uh, Keir Starmer? The, so why, the, why this particular conflict? Because what is happening and what we are witnessing is extraordinary and uh, and a, a game changer in our opinion. We have seen conflict many many times, too often across the globe, but in this instance, we are witnessing on our television screens, in uh, lo- in uh, real time, a genocide unfolding before our very And very do you think eyes. RT is not and reporting that, that accurately? Exception. I, I am making no such judgment. I am saying the Irish public broadcaster, on behalf of the Irish people that locates that position in the Irish democratic space, should embrace, not become alarmed, embrace every single mechanism, including peer reviews, independent of politics, that verify you know, and you confirm... Know that, that the NUJ is concerned about Sinn Féin particularly, your own action against RT, other multiple actions by members of your party against very, various media out, uh, outlets. And the charge is that you, you want to stifle the media, make them well, timorous at, and afraid. At, if, if, if that was our objective, we would have failed in it atrociously badly. I have no interest, we have no interest in stymieing anything whatsoever. Our interest is ensuring that in a democratic society that people have access to news, contrasting and different editorial stances, some of which will be critical of Sinn Féin. They're more than entitled, even hostile to Sinn Féin, more than entitled to that in a democratic uh, society. There's no issue there. But the public broadcast, the national broadcaster, has a particular duty to balance impartiality, scrutiny, and I think should be open to okay. peer Moving to peer on review. to Ukraine, you seem to want to ride two horses in this particular one. On the one hand, you have people like Matt Carthy supporting uh, the Ukrainian sovereignty and so on. Then you have the party uh, calling for all arms to, to Ukraine, to the warring parties, uh, to be uh, withdrawn. Now, Russia has its own supply of arms. There'll be no stopping that supply. Uh, what you're saying is stop the supply to Ukraine, which will result in Ukraine's defeat. Well, the, our position uh, is not contradictory at all. Let me restate our absolute uh, support for Ukrainian sovereignty and for, the Ukrainian, and for the Ukrainian people. Putin is the aggressor. We know that. Um, but I, I, I would say to you, Pat, that anybody who uh, views long-range missiles, be they British or American, going into Russia at this time and doesn't understand that that uh, represents a very, very dangerous escalation of a dangerous situation, has not read the memo. Our common effort and the international community's effort ought to be an end to the conflict. Yes, a Russian a withdrawal, but it is diplomacy and politics at the end of the day. When all of the blood is spilt and it's mainly young lives that are lost on all sides, it comes down to diplomacy and politics. I actually think there's a recognition of that, unspoken perhaps within the international community, but it now needs to be said out loud. And I think the Irish government has to do two things. Stand squarely with Ukraine, face down Putin by means of sanction and, and, and every international lever. But we also have to say out loud, at some point this conflict has to end. 
And I think you're, the you're, Irish you're position, de- the Irish position, the point. I am not avoiding any point. You want to any disarm point. Ukraine while wanting them to win the war against a, a non-disarmed no. Russia. Pat, I wa- what we want is the international community, which, by the way, has undermined it greatly its, its, its own standing in not holding Israel to account. But that's another story. I want the international institutions to do their job. And the role of an Irish uh, government is not to mimic or to fa- follow the pathway of the British or the Americans or anyone anyone else. We have to take an independent and a different view around how you resolve mm. conflict. We are a non-aligned, neutral state and we have to be true to our values of conflict resolution uh, and of peace whilst standing okay, firmly but, in the corner of yeah, Ukraine okay, but if, and if, calling if, out if Russia. What is, if you call for is done, they are bunched and there's no doubt well, about can that. I, let me predict this, Pat Kenny. What, what I have described to you, when, it, when the history books are written, see if I'm wrong, that it doesn't arrive at a point where it's diplomacy and politics that straightens this out. We know that. That's a kind of obvious thing based on your own party's history. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the uh, series Say Nothing on Netflix at the moment, which the timing of which being available to the electorate might be rather unfortunate given that the man who is accused of being in the IRA, although the programme says he constantly denies it, is Gerry Adams, your former leader, mm. who was mastermind of bombing and kidnapping and all the rest for the according to the series. Uh, and it does not show him or your party in a good light. Well, I haven't seen uh, the series um, and uh, so I can't comment directly Would on this. Would it not have been useful for you to inform yourself about the content of that series, uh, no. which is being widely watched? No, I, I don't believe so. I, I think what has been extremely useful on my part and I think what people recognise is now in the year 2024, heading into 2025, 26 years on from the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, Entire generations have been born and have grown up on an island that is peaceful. Um, I think that is something to be celebrated. I take great heart and great pride in that. And the past has to be acknowledged. Um, But the past is the past and we live in today. And my job as the leader of Sinn Féin, my job as a, a party that hopes to lead the next government, is to say that we are now ready mm. We are ready, we have our work done, we have the team and we are looking okay, for the chance that, that's, to lead that, that, that government. That, that's obviously your ambition. You did announce a complete overhaul of Sinn Féin's governance procedures because of all the scandals that have unfolded in the last uh, few weeks. Is that process in any way complete? Because there's a report in the Irish Times this morning that suggests it's not, it's chaotic. Well, it's not chaotic. It's, it's far from it. Uh, we had a series of challenging events that had to be dealt with. Um, In the course of that, uh, and I I would say in each of those cases, I ensured accountability and consequences for people who have uh, whose behaviour was not uh, up to scratch or up to standard. But in the course of all of that, uh, a number of gaps in our in our oversight mechanisms emerge. And of course, as the leader of the party, I have moved to correct Mm. that. I will, I hope, Pat have uh, a report back from that process this side of Christmas. Now, uh, finally, I should ask you about the uh, polls and they're very encouraging for your party after that difficult period. But when you look at uh, the the different uh, issues, housing, crime, economy, healthcare, immigration, climate change, cost of living, uh, on housing and healthcare, uh, Sinn Féin get a, a majority, if you like, better than the other two main parties. But when you add the existing parties, for example, on housing, 25% say Fine Gael, 21% say Fianna Fáil. That adds up to 46% versus 28% for Sinn Féin. And if you well, add some of the other numbers, presuming the, the Social Democrats, etc., might be supporting you, um, you know, it's not that encouraging in terms of but, the confidence of the public yeah. that you would form a better government. Well, listen, uh, I'm out now. The, the great beauty of these campaigns is that you get to be out and about everywhere, talk to people in here. I have met 0% of people with any confidence in Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil sorting the the housing crisis. And I have met countless people who, you talk about a chilling effect, who who were chilled at the idea that Fianna Fáil would say out loud that they should have the housing uh, ministry again. I think people looked at that prospect and said, there is no way on God's green earth that we can tolerate or endure another five years of failure from Fianna Fáil 
or Fine Gael at that stage. Well, I'm sure they will take issue with you tomorrow night. I'm no uh, doubt they will, Pat. The uh, leaders' debate yes. where there'll only be three, not ten. Thank yes, goodness. Yes, yeah, ten is a lot. Yeah. Mary Lou MacDonald, leader of Sinn Féin, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Now,